You know, the past couple of years, our opening day duck hunting stories have been lousy here on Michigan Outdoors. We haven't had much luck at all, but we are changing the tune tonight. We went out hunting with Bob Girat and Jim Schruger. Both of them are championship duck callers. We had a nice day about two days after the opener. We saw some ducks, we got our limits of ducks, and we have a good duck hunting story coming up for you, plus a great recipe, outdoor news, and a lot more. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. We're going duck hunting this Thursday night on Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can. It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Duck hunting, probably the most involved of all the types of hunting we have in North America. But for those who participate, it's one of the most interesting and exciting. It begins before sunrise, setting the decoys in a marsh. For puddle ducks, that's mallards, teal, wood ducks, the marshes are often small and shallow with muddy bottoms. A small camouflaged pram is the preferred duck boat for hauling decoys, dogs, and hunters. A three horsepower outboard might be used on big water, but for this marsh, using a pole is the easiest way to move the boat. Our hunters, Bob Girat and Jim Schruger from downriver Detroit area are dressed in typical camouflage from head to foot. Ducks have sharp eyes and they can spot bright, shiny clothing from far off. Insulated chest waders are necessary for picking up decoys and retrieving ducks. Decoys are most often imitations of mallards, the most commonly hunted duck in our part of the country, or most commonly sought after. In small ponds like this, only a dozen or so decoys are needed, but on big open water bays, hunters often set out a hundred, sometimes two and three hundred decoys in a spread. A few half decoys imitate the puddle ducks that are tipped up to feed. All of this designed to make the area in front of the hunters look attractive to flying ducks. Well, and geese for that matter. A couple of goose decoys are set off to the side. There's no telling when a flock of geese will fly over that can be enticed to land on this pond. So far, we've dressed for ducks, used the boat, set the decoys, and brought the dog. Labrador retrievers are far and away the most popular among duck hunters. They love the water, have a sharp eye for ducks, and sit still while the ducks are circling. Next step is to make a blind. From hundreds of yards in the air, ducks and geese can see all kinds of movements on the ground, and hunters that aren't hidden scare most of the ducks away. Bob and Jim stretch a burlap blind across a couple of poles. That's the basis for their blinds in most any setting that they hunt, something to hide behind as ducks approach. Now, we're hunting from shore today. Happens to be the best spot with open water just 20 yards in front. And the sun is more or less behind us, helps us see the ducks approaching from the north, and puts our shaded side towards the ducks. Every little bit of strategy helps, especially when we have a cameraman in the blind. With the constant focusing and moving, the camera often flares the ducks away. But with a little luck, we'll get some good tape of the ducks that maybe aren't so wary. Jim and Bob dress up the blind with some natural deadfalls and marsh grass. That helps camouflage our camouflage burlap. I told you, you can't be too careful. All of this elaborate preparation and almost intrigue is a part of the mystique of duck hunting. Now we're ready for another element, calling. Bob Girat is a championship caller. He just won the Ohio State duck calling title, and Jim Shruga won the Ohio goose calling and the best overall calling title in a recent competition. They are good. There she is on the water. Let's see if we can talk her over here. Maybe it was the camera, but this hen is wary. The calling must be good and the decoy set right because the ducks really want to come in. Now we have three wood ducks coming in from the north, setting their wings. Looks like they're going to land slightly out of range near that lone hen mallard. Be 
you can see the thrill of duck hunting being hidden in a marsh using all sorts of deceptive techniques that <laughs> most often don't work. Most ducks look over the decoys, listen to your calls, but pass on by. What makes it exciting is that you can often entice them to fly over, maybe circle a couple of times, and this is fun. Now these ducks right here, look at them, they're responding to Bob Girat and Jim Shruga. They're making a turn and are circling to see where those calls are coming from. If everything goes right, they'll think the decoys in front of us are a group of contented ducks that want some company. There they go. They're setting their wings, so they decided to land. Well, maybe not. Maybe another turn, but they're sure thinking about it. Better take them. Take them. Take them. Better take them, Jimmy. One down. They're down. A flurry of action, two ducks on the water, and Jim's dog, Smurf, bounds off into the marsh. Smurf is only a year and a half old, still a pup, really, and still in training for duck hunting, but her instincts are right. Now, the footing is a little precarious here for Jim. He sets Smurf on the mark where the duck is down. There he goes, and once she sees it in the water, this young lab does her thing. Yep. Oh, okay. A pretty sight to duck hunters. The retriever work is another very enjoyable aspect of the duck hunt. These dogs love to retrieve ducks, and when they do it with style and flair, it makes everybody in the hunting party proud, not just the owner. Good girl. Good girl. Oh, such a good pintail. Yeah. Now we got a hen pintail there towards our daily limit of 135 points, along with a widgeon from this last group of ducks, and all the skills were involved. Decoy placement, camouflage, calling, shooting technique, and retriever work. These are things the hunter can practice and control. But perhaps the most important part of this hunt is the habitat. Without marshes and potholes like this, we wouldn't have any ducks. The owner of this five-acre flooding is Don Harris from Langsburg. He gave a special permission to hunt his pet marsh, habitat he's developed for ducks, a beautiful setting to enjoy in October. You know, I don't know how you guys have the stamina to blow so long and keeping, keep it so good. I mean, you know, you go on and on and on. That you must... <laughs> Well, there's a secret to calling, too, Fred. You build up a little pressure in a call, and you don't use a lot of air out of your lungs. A lot of fellas use just their their wind rather than building up the pressure in a call, and you can like, make a lot more quacks if you know how to blow a call and put the pressure mm. in a call. And uh, it gives you a little longevity when you're blowing like that. But you do run out of gas. <laughs> I know I have to stop and take a puff once in a while. <laughs> Get blown up. I, my duck hunting partner told me he's going to get me a bottle of oxygen sometime. Yeah. And stick it in my <laughs> cheek or something to keep me going. A little pinch oxygen between your cheek and gum. That's right. Well, what are all these represent? They're bands from birds that you've small taken. Ones, small ones were off a of little teal. Smaller birds like that, and the rest of them came off of mallards and widgeon and the rest of it. Don't you have to turn those ears? Uh, we did. We. What you do is you send a number in. Excuse me. I was looking at a duck. Yeah, I know. Uh, you send a number into Washington. And uh, they send you back a report on it, and of course that's all they need. They don't really care about the band itself. You can keep the band. Oh, but, uh, I see. I send the information send... off the band to Washington. Oh, I see. The address and everything is right on each band. And then they tell you where the uh, duck was raised, when he was released, and et cetera, how old he is. What have you What have you learned from these bands? Oh, got ducks are from all over the country, from uh, about 13 years old to barely 13 year old duck. Well, here's some geese. Oh, 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 over on the horizon. Man. Oh, God. Where's Jim? Yeah. <laughs> These geese not only caught Bob and I by surprise, but OJ behind the camera was a little off guard, too, but he finds them in the lens so we can see the geese turn towards us, responding to the expert calling of Bob Girat and Jim Schroeder. You can see some of those geese breaking formation, rearranging their flight patterns. Some evidently want to come our way. Hunting ducks and geese is never predictable. You have to be alert every minute while you're concentrating on calling, watching the sky, staying camouflaged. What you're about to see is a typical example of the unpredictability of duck hunting.
I better go get him. What a beauty. It all happened quickly. While Bob's eyes were on the geese, I just happened to see the duck approaching from the east, setting its wings to land in our decoys. Or Bob tosses a stick to catch Smurf's attention, so the dog takes off towards the duck. He didn't see it go down. Smurf grabbed the stick, but Jim used his voice and hand signals to put Smurf on the duck. There he got it. Since Smurf is still in training, Jim blows his whistle constantly during the retrieve, so Smurf knows that that means to bring the duck back to the blind. And so far, he's performing perfectly. This time, the duck was a wood duck, delicious eating, brightly colored, 70 points towards the limit, ending the hunt for me. In fact, we all limited out on this morning of hunting. A good way to start the duck season with some scrumptious puddle ducks for the table. We got 10 of them all together for our party, and thanks to Don Harris allowing us to hunt his private farm pond, we could bring you a successful duck hunt the way we like to see it in Michigan outdoors. In a normal year, the good duck hunting that we just had early in the season would mean that there's even more good duck hunting coming up, but that's not the case this year. Very successful bow hunt. It looks like we've had a good year, and it looks like some anglers have had a good fall, too. Take a look at this in our trophy book. the excitement of hunting season in October. It's difficult, at least for me, to take time to fish since, well, we can do it the rest of the year. But big crappies like this 16-incher make me reconsider. You know, you can see why some anglers fish right through the hunting season. Frank Poikus from New Hudson was, I think, casting for bass with a big O when this nearly two-pound crappie hit an October 14th trophy from Kent Lake in Oakland County. And about two months ago, John Keller from Saginaw took this six-pound largemouth from Tomahawk flooding near Alpena. He was fishing a plastic worm rigged Texas style. When that fish hit midday, largemouth was 21 inches long. And even more recently, this 21-inch smallmouth bass was caught in Lake Cadillac. Good fishing lake for many species. Imagine it's productive right now. It's close to duck hunting, by the way, so anglers have plenty of elbow room. Chester Norris from Saginaw caught this five-pound, three-ouncer on a jig and pig, a good technique in the fall. Now you'd think that Lake Gogebic in the UP was the only place that produces trophy perch. Must be that Saginaw Bay produces more small ones than big ones. But Robert Nickel from Mishawaka, Indiana, caught this nearly 15-inch yellow perch a few weeks ago from Lake Gogebic fishing with a night crawler. That perch tipped the scale at one pound, 15 ounces. Used to be that pink salmon were primarily on the Lake Huron side in the northern lower peninsula, but they've moved west. Fishing the Boyne River with a spinner, Brad King from Boyne City landed this 20-inch pink salmon a couple weeks ago. With their humped backs, pink salmon are impossible to mistake for any other salmon or trout species. Now here's a fish that has not been entered in the Master Angler program for two years. It, this one's 30 inches long, weighs 14 and a half pounds. It's a big coho salmon. Caught early in September off the tip of the thumb, this will probably be the only coho entry this year. It's obviously gonna be the largest, and it earns Leslie Jean Gilbert from Flat Rock the honor of being our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. If a lot of you folks are calling that 800 number to get some information on our hunting laws, I, I don't blame them, Bob, but <laughs> things like that tree stand law, that is a screwball law. It, I maintain that, and we're going to unravel that next week. It's complex at its simplest. <laughs> okay. That's right. And it's, uh, well, anyway, we're going to get into that in detail next week and explain that to you because we have the facts on that matter. Right now, let's take a couple legal questions. Bob, for you, here's one from Steve Flannery from Warren. He says, you can hunt deer with a bow during gun deer season if you have a gun deer license. You can also use the same gun deer license for your muzzleloader during the special muzzleloading season. My question is, can you hunt deer with a bow on your gun deer license during the muzzleloading season? Trying well, to weasel in on that one. I know what you answer he wants on that, but the answer is no, you cannot hunt deer with a bow and arrow during the muzzleloading season on the gun deer license. That's only good for November 15th to 30th. 
and beginning December 1st, you must use your bow license. And the law of 1980 Licensing Act is very specific about that. Okay, now here's one. Oh, here's a hot one. Ryan Danzer from Owasso wants to know if somebody saw a person doing something illegal during hunting season, like poaching, could he make a citizen's arrest? Would it be legal to say, put down the gun or I'll shoot? If they were committing a crime, what would happen if you shot the person? Oh, jeepers, creepers, I'll tell you, well, don't, no, 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 stay away from that sort of thing. Those hunting laws are misdemeanors. You can go down and swear out a complaint, but you cannot take make a, a person arrest. into custody or make a citizen's no. arrest. If Only you, felonies. That's right. If you hold a gun on somebody and say, hey, you know, stop what you're doing or I'll shoot, you are committing a felony. You're liable to be thrown in the clinker longer than the person you're absolutely trying to apprehend. L leave the tough stuff unless it's absolutely life-threatening right now situation. Leave it to the law enforcement community. Right. Well, we're going to be right back in a minute uh, with an upbeat note with the biggest deer, the biggest Boone and Crockett buck ever taken in Michigan. But first, let's see if you can answer this question in this week's Outdoor Quiz. The hunting fraternity has its share of specialists, but what percent of hunters who hunt with a bow also hunt with a firearm? According to a recent series of national focus group interviews, 80% of America's 1,250,000 bow hunters also hunt with a gun each year. Eight out of 10 big game hunters said they would like to try hunting with a bow. It looks like a big rack, but, but Mark, it, it doesn't, I mean, do people say this is the biggest one? Because it doesn't have all the points and gnarls and... No, I think... Not many people tell me it's the biggest one, and I know it's not, but it's definitely uh, pretty symmetrical and pretty rad. Well, that's, yeah, that's that's the thing. That's why this goes in the top of the Boone and Crockett record right. book in Michigan. Perfect. This is the top. It's just about perfect. It has a little tine there comes out, which you would per get a deduction for right. yeah. on the Boone and Crockett. But that's just about perfect symmetry. What does it score? 186 and 1 8. 186 and 1 8. That's the score to beat for you trophy hunters who want to get a big one. Did you know when you saw this deer that it would measure out as big as it did? Or well, did you think there's just a 10 point? No, I kind of did because a friend of mine told me that he thought it would measure 190 before deductions. Yeah. And when it was measured, it was right, it was right on the right money. Right on when the 190? Yeah. Same guy that had seen it. The first is, that time. Your, is that your lifetime hunting buddy now? Yeah. yeah always and, and guide? <laughs> Turned out that way. Great. Are you, are you a, a, a real hot dog deer hunter? No, I, are you an average deer hunter? Or you I a real spend deer all day in the woods. I'll say that much. Okay, that makes a big difference. Uh, I love to deer hunt. What's the key to deer hunting? I mean, everybody can't get a big rack like this. But a guy that wants to put some meat in the freezer, or a gal who wants to hunt deer, what's your advice? Uh, take it seriously. Uh, and seriously, stay out in the woods all day. What time do you get out in the morning? I get out before daylight, probably 5.30 or so. Okay. And I'll hunt all day. When you hunt all day, do you always sit? Yeah, pretty much so. You're not a still hunter, you don't I move. Get, everybody gets a little bored now and then, you gotta walk a little bit, but I'll find another place to sit once I walk so far. How, what kind of place do you look for? Well, sit? somewhere where there's not a lot of hunting pressure. Oh, okay, so that's important to you, yeah. to find a place that's out of the way from hunting. Nice. You're a buck hunter? Yeah. Trophy buck hunter? Well, now I am, I guess. Now you are? Yeah. Everything's going to look so tiny when it comes through the woods well, this I'm hunting season. Well, I'm going to be pretty picky from are now you? on. Yeah. Mark Ritchie, Boone and Crockett record holder for Michigan, knows the tricks for successful deer hunting. Doesn't this look excellent? What you're looking at here is a stir-fry recipe, another one of Kathy's creations. <laughs> a good one. Boy, this is good. <laughs> this was done with duck. And I'm glad in four years we've never had one of those duck recipes on the show that, where it's put in the oven for two hours and soaked in wine. 82 ingredients, oh. right. Boy, this is great, It Kathy. is. It, and it was easy. Why don't you share with the folks the secret of your stir fry here? Okay. We got a duck. And it called for one onion, and I put two because we had small onions. Soy sauce, which you usually find in a stir fry. Mm -hmm. And a tablespoon. I added just a little bit more. A tablespoon, huh? <laughs> right. Is Some sherry, and you need a tablespoon of that, and I also added just a touch more of that, because we're going to stir fry quite a bit here. And cornstarch, which is a thickening, and I need a tablespoon of that. Now, what, what is this for? Okay, cornstarch does thicken 
the marinade. And cornstarch is a lot finer than flour. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you a real pasty, floury taste. Does it make a sweeter taste, too? No, it doesn't. It doesn't change the flavor whatsoever. That's another good thing about it. Flour does. They corn starch corn, won't. Yeah, they put cornstarch in Milky Ways, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> it has to be good. <laughs> okay, we want a cube or onion. Just it, because it'll break apart. You don't want it real small because it will break apart while stirring and cooking. Put the okay. onion in with the marinade. Right in with the marinade, right. It, it does. Just it. a little bit of flavor. Notice no salt, no pepper, no uh -huh. other seasonings. Well, there's a lot of salt in the soy sauce. It, there is. But that isn't very much marinade. No, it doesn't look like a lot, but it's not going to actually soak because we're going to put it all together in the wok. Now, boning out a duck, uh, it's amazing how there's no white meat on a duck. It's right. very, it's very dark. It looks like beef. It does. In fact, it tastes a lot like yep. beef. This, I think, is scrumptious. It tastes just a touch like liver, the first taste or two. First taste or two, but it doesn't have a strong liver taste. No, it's very, very good. You want to put this in for 30 minutes in your marinade. Just kind of stir it all up and let it all soak So together. that marinade isn't, it's just sort of in contact with the duck. Right. It isn't submerging it in right. the duck. And then the stir fry. Right. And don't cook it very long because you cook, it is dark meat, so you want to cook it high and hot. You can see right here when I, this stuff just cuts with a fork. And you can see inside, put a little piece there, the, the texture is like beef. It's like roast beef. Uh, it should be a slight bit pink. And uh, oh, not I like it's... chicken or poultry at all. Mm -mm. Mm. <laughs> Man, that's good. I've taken an entire duck breast before, you know, breasted mm -hmm. them out and fried them all up like you would a little steak or whatever, and they're, they're delicious. But I like Chinese food, and this mm -hmm. is as good as any Chinese food I've ever eaten. You know, mm -hmm. this would be good with probably with other game or mm -hmm. dark meat. Type of thing. Or beef. Probably, you could use it with beef. Probably would be good with chicken mm -hmm. or venison or grouse yeah. it's, or it's pheasant. It's a very basic recipe you can apply to anything. But right. you know, with those few ingredients, it's mm -hmm. amazing how Chinesey this right. tastes. Right. It's really amazing. A stir fry recipe that you could use with all kinds of things. I, I think this is this is one of our top recipes. I of do the too. Year. I, do, I really do. I'll go along with that. <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy stir fry. Bob, why don't you tell the folks where they can get a copy of this recipe? How old he is. What have, you, what have you learned from these bands? Oh, we've got ducks for, from all over the country, from uh, about 13 years old to barely... 13-year-old ducks. Wait, here's some geese. Oh, 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 over on the horizon. <laughs> these geese not only caught Bob and I by surprise, but O.J. behind the camera was a little off guard too, but he finds them in the lens so we can see the geese turn towards us, responding to the expert calling of Bob Jurat and Jim Schroeder. <laughs> 